It's the first time I came to a Gen conference and when Albert invited me I was really happy about it because working with trees and working in a forest and trying to find solutions to all that's going on my only answer is we have to become conscious of community building and we have to build a new relationship with nature but what relates us with nature is the understanding of how nature builds communities we have to make our communities compatible with natural communities. In the end, that's the condensed message. How to do it? And what are the issues? I am very happy about what I've heard so far and about the spirit that I found here at the Gen Encounter. Especially this morning, it came to me like this finally touched the core of what we need to deal with. First of all, I heard the first political words this morning about the conflicts we have on this globe. We are at war and we can be getting along very well. We can find all reasons to have pleasant relationships around us. But the reality is most of the Earth's population is at war. And most people don't even know what this war is. It's a terrible war. I call it World War III. We are in the middle of World War III. And what is this World War? Because we will never be able to finish it, to stop it, to find an alternative, if we don't even realize what the conflict is about. One of the aspects of this war is the war against trees and forests the destruction of nature in its most expressive forms. The best made communities on earth, the most solid, the longest, the self-reviving, self-restoring communities that exist in all different climate systems. Even underwater, I call much of what we have under the ocean also a forest. They are being systematically destroyed as are many human communities. It's the same issue. So, what is it about? There was this wonderful song after our session this morning in the tent. One by one, remember? Everyone, how does it continue? Comes to remember. Comes to remember. the world one heart of the I think this could be the theme. Because when you look at the complexity of these issues, that is the way to start finding the solution. I will tell you a little about how I came to create this approach for myself, how I think we could start tackling it. I'm very happy about the diversity of, of interests and backgrounds that we have here. I've done a lot of educational work around the world and there is one basic experience to that. Whenever 15 people come together and seriously think about the quests and the problems they have to tackle, and they take time to do it together and they find ways to do it together, they can solve anything. Anything. It has worked in all countries with all kinds of people so this could become the start for something very different. And I'm very happy to see that in the Baltic countries, Finland, all those around us who are represented here, there's a growing consciousness, a growing interest in the topic. Things are already beginning to happen. And what we need is, again, to define how we could do it in community, supporting each other. What is the war that we're in? Very simple. It's a war of the rich against the poor. But when you have the war of the rich against the poor, what can you do? So obviously, the rich have all the means to win that war, as long as we don't change the means. What is the chance the poor have? to resist 
a war that is thrown upon them by the rich. So I have not seen the real answer in human societies. There have been some examples. Gandhi has said one. Thoreau has said one. Those are the people I related to when I started working. But I have not seen the example to really motivate people to act differently. So how can we do it? And when I don't know, I just ask, how is nature doing it? If the forest is a community, as society is, and the forest is being menaced by the same kind of war of the rich against the poor, those who have machines against those who just grow as trees. How does the forest react? It remembers its roots. We know a lot nowadays about how forests work. And we know a lot about how our society works. We have become to learn about that. But let's connect that. We're beginning to understand the mechanisms that create domination in our society. Very slowly. We're beginning to understand that there are oppressive mechanisms. And that all oppression creates a state of war. So what does the forest do when it realizes the same thing? How does a forest react when at some part of the forest the big machines come automated cutting, cutting five hectares per day, pulling them off to some cellulosis factory. Do you know what the forest does? Regrow. It sends information to the soil. It sends information. It simply shares what's happening. It just shares. I would dare say that in the forest there are no, there's a lot of communication, but there are no emotions. There's only communication based on information. I love this community because there's a specific spiritual background here represented by Ingvar. I don't know how many of you have been in his sessions. He talks about that. What's real about our mental perception of what happens? What is really unimportant because it's just on the surface. It's just things that others told us to do, to be. That's what usually dominates our society. So we are often afraid of looking at what's happening. We don't talk about what is happening in our society. We don't talk about the destruction. I often said this morning, I, we talked about Indians in North America. One of the examples I always use there is, how could so many motivated, inspired, enthusiastic people who went to the US for a better life, how could they be transformed into something that participated into killing all the indigenous people? How did that happen? I'm sure there were many amongst them who were just as motivated as you are today. Mm. We know many stories about settlers who, well, the only thing they had in mind was to do a beautiful permaculture farm, had they had the, no, had they had the name. Yeah? There were mechanisms set in place to transform them into destructors. So we have to understand those mechanisms. In that case, it was a monetary system that was used to change the people's attitude, attitude and behavior. And very often we don't look at these system characteristic aspects that determine what really happens. The monetary system at that time was a system based on paying people with alcohol not with money. They were paid originally with rum and later with whiskey. Whiskey was the currency at the time of Holocaust and murder 
on that continent. The same one was with Sami, it was the same. Mm. Yeah. And people did not realize that the drug was the tool of domination. And it still is today. That's the role drugs play. We talk about individual liberties dealing with drugs. How can anybody think about individual liberties when that drug is really the tool of domination? We have to look at the system, not at the symptom of what we find. You are on drugs? In many ways. No, I mean, this is what America says. They have a war on drugs. Oh, well. This is the... Yeah. But it has double meaning. <laughs> yes, I know. We could see it as a double meaning. as it yes. yeah. mm -hmm. So, there's one event that Lilioro has presented us, is presenting us, that I really love. I think it goes to the core of the issue. I don't know who went into this little house over there where they sing their, your name. Who has been there? I have been there. I was very surprised. I didn't know about it. I came in there and I loved it. And you know why? It is about the role of the individual, about how you perceive yourself as an individual, who you are in society. And that is what we have to learn from the forest also. There, they take your name, they have this ritual, curtain opens and oh, look at all these people, they sing my name. Yeah? It's valuing the individual in the anonymous big society. And that is what the forest shows us also. When a forest communicates, it communicates to every single one. Forests are connected over vast distances. And there can be many different forests. They have no emotions, they have no fear. And they would talk about the state of the world, I think, very different from what we heard this morning, for example. We heard about examples of oppression this morning. And then we talk, well, do you have hope for the world? The world is not just those examples of expression, oppression. It's also not just some good example or some hope I might have. The world is big, and whatever change is coming, there may be big violent changes, there may be beautiful changes, anything is possible. There will be many, many different situations. The world is not uniform. The world is composed of many different examples of how forests, of trees, and people can live together. And amongst these many, many examples, some may represent a solution in certain, under certain conditions. The world has probably undergone this kind of crisis many, many times. And I don't think that at any time before that crisis anybody would have known exactly who would produce the new reality, the new thriving societies that occurred after that. So we have to learn about these things. We have to learn about these mechanisms. And the next thing that touched me very much this morning was that finally in some organization, some social context, people very consciously start talking about how the old relate to the young. That is the essential mechanism. I had one criticism from a Latin American point of view. I, I didn't see the young. To me these were all older people. I believe these questions should have been discussed with what you call children at this part of the world between 12 and 18. They should be part also. But the general approach is already a big, big, big step. And it led to a final question, which is exactly what we're dealing with. Talking about transformation. How do, you do, how do you preserve values and yet change according to the needs of the new generation? Look at what the forest does. 
foresters know that botan botanists know that in forests we call them successions. The forest lives through phases. It can create a society and make that society break down. A succession collapses <coughs> and a new succession follows. And it collapses again and another more mature succession follows. In the rainforest areas where I live, you could observe, it's a matter of interpretation, but you could observe four or five successions from replanting a deforested area to a mature rainforest. So what is a mature rainforest? It's one where there are some real elders. They communicate with all the others. And there are some very productive forest layers. And there are some very young layers. And there's a regenerative mechanism. Transformation has become the dynamic in the mature forest. And before you reach that maturity, which would correspond to the perfect world where everybody is in constant harmony, something we don't see presently, before that, there are mechanisms of developing one phase <coughs> and then give space to the next one. The old societies of the Maya, the Inca, and the Aztecs, they solved this issue by establishing a calendar that asked society, that forced society to deeply change every 50 years, more or less. After 50 years, what they did, they dissolved their institutions. And they gave the interregnum to the priests, just to have somebody responsible during that time for whatever was needed. But those two years were to demolish the old, to shut down all institutions, close them, burn the papers, get out of them, get some distance, take some distance, get some rest. Be available for other things. They had all sorts of ceremonies in the households, for example. They abolished all ceramics. You had to shatter all your ceramics and do new ones. A lot of symbolic things. Why? And afterwards, the young generation had the opportunity to build new institutions as they were needed. Because an institution never changes. It never transforms. That worked beautifully until the Spaniards came. So, Something was missing at a world scale to regulate these things. But we have those examples. So there is a relationship between the mature societies that the world has seen and what we can see in the forest. Aaron, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. um, do you, have, have you had the experience that trees will voluntarily die to make room and space for other trees, even though they're not diseased or damaged or at the yes. end of their life? Yeah. I reconstruct a pre-Hispanic Mayan village, something nobody has ever done. I reconstruct the village after I have reconstructed rainforest. I bought a piece of land where nothing was growing, it was all destroyed, they had burnt it several times, they had sent cattle over it, it was full of thorny shrubs. And once I had it going somehow and the environment was uh, beginning to feel somewhat more comfortable, I moved in there. I've been living there for 15 years now. And I discovered the traces of a pre-Hispanic ancient village and then I started reconstructing this ancient village. So. I'm answering your question, it's just a little loop. When we started reconstructing that village, first question was, well, how do you start a village? And I started it with the spiritual center. I identified, seemed to identify old energy lines, and I could define very exactly where the spiritual center was, the energetic center of the old village. There was no ruin or anything. It was deep under the ground that later we found some proof of what we were doing, or we're still finding it. 
And once we had the first provisional buildings there, and we had started establishing some measurements of where the first houses were going to be, we're building on old platforms, we did a ceremony. Everything in the Mayan world is accompanied by ceremony. You ask for permission, you communicate with the space, you communicate with the environment. And we invited the woman to be our guardian and to be with us. And there were 200 people who all were very happy to have a new saint, as they say. Indigenous culture is very influenced by Catholic belief. We invited Mary Magdalene. After that very moving ceremony, on a barren hill where only shrubs had grown and nobody had ever seen a real high tree, one of the elders who was working with me came and said, now on the top of the hill where you said the center of this village was, there's a yashche growing. Yashche is the old holy tree of the Mayans. Nobody had ever seen one grow on a hill. Nobody had ever, it would ever have expected a tree like that to grow there. There were no seed trees around. It was very difficult to imagine how this had happened. And the tree was already there. It was thriving. So we watched this tree very carefully over the coming years. It's now 10, 12 years old. It's 12 years, I think. It's now 12 meters high. Another tree grew beside it. And this other tree started growing a little faster than the Yashche. And it protected it to the south. It shaded it. And it was crooked. This was the Yashche, and the other tree grew like this towards the south, producing shade. It looked quite amazing. And we wondered. Some people told me, well, you have to cut it because the real tree we want is the Yashche. I didn't cut it. Last year, from one moment to the other, this flourishing strong tree. It just died. It just dried. Then we cut it when it was completely dry. And the Yashche is thriving and very strong and 12 meters high. This has been described by many knowledgeable people in the forest. In the forest there's a constant communication going about how can we support, how we can help how we can collaborate with each, with each other. The forest is the sum of individuals that every single one are worth their name. They can be called by their name, by their function, <coughs> by their special role. But this kind of individuals that we have in the forest is the individual that offers something to the other and that can cooperate with the other that adds up to something more with the others. And thereby we, got, we get the phenomena that we all know, and that is hardly ever looked upon, that we can say that the sum of the forest is more, that the forest is more than the sum of the trees. Yeah? It becomes more. So that's what we're heading for. How can we make our forests, how can we make our communities become more than the sum of the individuals present there? Because then everybody will feel their advantage and everybody will love building those communities. And that is the task all the gen communities are struggling with, in a way. Maybe not naming it the very same way. That is the task of those who think that just seeing the wood, the forest as timber, as the sum of the masses of timber that are standing there and cutting them down, have to confront. How, we can, how can we get more? How can we value the individual in the forest without losing 
the view for the big community? And how can we make those individuals work, participate, be part, be active part of it, without losing the spirit of the community? I believe trees sing and dance. Their communication is probably very much more similar to our singing and dancing than to any other communication we do. But we know that if we spend all our lives only singing and dancing, uh, we probably not get that far. You know? We need a little more. And there is there's some real work also to be done. So what we have to figure out is how do we go about this real work? Because we're talking about complex communities. It's too much to be done. We cannot tackle everything. How can we take the first steps that will not only allow us to contribute to prospering forests, prospering communities, but at the same time include all those who are working there? And those include the big companies that produce poisonous furniture for IKEA or cellulose for big factories. I would say nowadays, those are part of the forest. They are part of the communities. And we will not succeed if we don't recognize that they have to be part of whatever solution comes in the future. We live in a world where we were taught there are the forests and there's the agriculture, the farming. You had to separate that. Well, nowadays, neither one of them functions in a way that we really like. Mm -hmm. We have to include those also. When people talk about agroforestry, well, that's like they're desperate about this separation between producing food and, and having forests. It should be the most natural thing that whatever we do in our cooperation with nature should be integrated and should be respectful of the soil, of the food plants, of the forest, of the birds, of the mushrooms, and so on. Can, can I give an example for Netherlands? Please. Uh, the problem I see in Netherlands is that the nature organizations, which are separate from agroforestry, they tend to cut down the trees because they say uh, in 100, 150 years ago this were uh, uh, open land, heaven, and this was actually uh, depleted time, but they say we want to bring it back to that time. So I can see uh, a benefit yeah. of having a yeah. Uh, wood yeah. uh, wanting company in the nature. We have big conflicts in the world between, mm -hmm. between those who want to live with the forest and those who want to preserve forests sometimes. Absolute protection can very often be the worst thing to do because it doesn't allow you to establish a relationship with the forest. Mm -hmm. We are part of the forest. Mm -hmm. We should be part of it. But the question is, what kind of part? When I was brought up, I had a strong relationship with, ship with trees. But all I heard about forest was that you should be afraid of being in the forest. There's a lot of fear connected to it. Starting with old fairy tales, starting with what my parents' generation told about the war. Forest was something to be afraid of. <clears throat> we need to change that. So I believe we must consider going to the very root of the problem. Then we can probably find a key to changing the key issues in our society, in our world. Not just the forestry issues, but also our community issues, our social issues with the same kind of approach. Nowadays, that is why I am so interested in continuing to work for forests. 
how do we deal with those mechanisms that could transform the world of a war between the rich and the poor and the total exploitation and destruction of our most precious resources into something thriving and prosperous. It's a way of learning. It's an educational task. It's a task that all will have to participate in. And we need to establish mechanisms which represent the many, many, many who can contribute to this process somehow at different places. So what we have sort of decided these days, after meeting people here who come from different forest backgrounds or who are interested in the topic, is to go on preparing a network between these future forest-oriented people. In Lithonia there are proposals to organize a forest festival next year. And we want to include all sorts of initiatives. My proposal is to network this throughout the world and have people dealing with the same questioning from the rainforest areas, from deserted areas. I work with people in the Gobi Desert to green the Gobi Desert, uh, Baltic states, wherever. And let them operate for one reason, to really always find the common denominator and see how this is an issue, not only all over the world because we have forest all over the world, but because it is it has so intimately to do with the <coughs> social quest that we are tackling, with community building, with new community building. I believe in education, the best teacher we have is nature. It's our benchmark. There's nothing with more experience. And even though this, the communication in forests goes very slow, not as fast as our thinking, but the forest has experience over periods a thousand times longer, or maybe a million times longer, than we humans do. There is experience of how you change complex societies. And we can learn from that. And we have tools. Because the many, many initiatives, I believe, have already found all the tools that we will need to create these prosperous future forests and to make them livable and economically viable. But it has to be adapted by people who see, who open their senses, who understand so that's what the communication in the network should be about. Always coming back to the simple basic needs to be able to, to create a process of community building. Never forget that. Because we people have, I talked about the difficulty, well, that Ingvar talks about, that we fall for emotions, we fall for outside expectations instead of really pursuing our own mission, our own perception, our own sense. And then on the other side, we fall for a quick fix. It. Somebody comes and makes a technology proposal. That's it. We all go behind this technology proposal. Yeah? But what is technology? The Mayans were very good at handling technology very often said that society didn't even have the wheel. They didn't even know the wheel. They knew the wheel. We found many toys. Mayan boys constructed little cars and played with them. But in the society as a whole, they decided we will not use the, way, the wheel for public transport or for any kind of transport. They constructed beautiful roads. They had thousands thousands of kilometers of very built, very well built roads. I saw some of them still. They were still working after, uh, still in good shape after 500 years. None of our roads will be in good shape after 500 years. They'll all be gone. But they used them for walking. And they used them for communication. 
they organize their walking in a way that there would be a maximum of communication and <coughs> meeting. Information was spread in enormous speed over vast areas, very hard to imagine nowadays. I think they were in many ways better spreading their information than we are even today with the internet. They had like a living internet and they did not need any batteries because they would probably have said batteries, they're obnoxious, they kill the environment, why should we have batteries? So why should we have an internet if we can make people move in a way that they communicate directly? <coughs> if we can develop telepathy, and so on. And they carried, and they carried, what did they carry? I think they would, they would have found us absolutely crazy seeing that product number one that we carry nowadays is petroleum. Energy that you can produce anywhere it comes free from the sun or from the wood. So why occupy a mortal transport system, it's mortal because we kill so many people in our transport, to transport energy or anything else. There was one thing where these societies had an issue because they wanted to exchange. There was commerce because commerce is something people like. They want to share things. They want to produce, they want to be seen, they want to be recognized for what they do. It's our most important personal need. So when you don't exchange commodities, as we do nowadays, when you don't ship television sets around the world and similar things, what do you ship around? Do you know what that was in former times? Most important commercial good? in Europe, in all other continents, before our consumerist times. What was the most important commercial good? Spices. Slaves. Slaves. People. People. Scandinavia was very, very involved in this. The Vikings were the biggest slave dealers of the old world. We have the old ledgers of the slave trade. <coughs> 600,000 Scandinavian slaves in one year handled over Sicily. Sicily was a hub for the slave trade in the 6th century, for example. In one year, well documented. Why? These were well treated, these slaves. They were precious goods. They were not like what we heard from the United States, how they treated slaves there. Except, uh, especially if they were beautiful blonde women and they were sold to Arab sheikhs, they were not necessarily able to select which sheikh they would have in bed. Huh? But, but they had a good life in many ways. And they were very much appreciated. That's a shame. <laughs> Sorry, Rana. Huh? I'm not so sure. Yeah. Well, I made this one, yeah, but you read a lot about them, a lot of literature about them. Uh, nowadays, slaves are probably much better, much worse off to see it in relative terms. Uh, I don't know, I think it was Oxfam who did once an analysis of slavery in the world. Yeah. When you look at de facto slavery in the world, it's tremendous. It's tremendous how many people are forced to live and work under conditions that they would never select themselves, but never work. Under brutal conditions, extreme, the extreme brutality. Yeah? So we have to deal with those issues. If that is how we, if consumerism is how we overcame slavery, then we also have to find an alternative to how to deal with a phenomenon that people need to exchange something and tend to then trade with other people. That's again a community issue. How do we deal with each other in the community? How do we do it in the forest? How do you bring people to work and live with the forest? 
Many of the alternatives we look at, they demand people to be in the forest. And many of the technologies we use today, these big machines that eat the forest and destroy it completely, you know why we have them? Because there are no people who would go and do the work by hand, who would not do the physical work. So how do we motivate people to again do the physical work? I was one of Europe's, probably one of Europe's first victims of herbicide contamination. My family had big tree nurseries. They produced millions and millions of trees planted all over Germany over the past 200 years. And after the war, all of a sudden, industrialization was favored and working in the industry was better paid than working out in the field. And my grandfather had, at some periods during the year, up to 700 people out in the field weeding and preparing trees. And all of a sudden they couldn't get these people anymore. And the whole nursery business, which was very, very instrumental because forests had been destroyed over the war, reforestation was extremely important, it, it didn't know how to operate anymore. There was a danger of everything breaking down. So my father heard of herbicide. In Germany there was a law prohibiting the use of any poison out in the fields. A law that makes a lot of sense. He went to England, he smuggled the first herbicides into Germany. He lost a lot of trees with the first experiments and then later on they, they knew how to do it and then they started applying herbicides throughout the nurseries. There were at, six, at that time 6,500 tree nurseries, forest tree nurseries in the north of Germany. Well, nobody cared. With all this enthusiasm about herbicides, nobody cared about the little boy who rode his bicycle. And when he came home from school, he had to, I had to go through this cloud of <coughs> herbicides because they were sprayed. And then I became the sickest child in school. And everybody was so enthusiastic about the herbicides that they never thought about the possibility that the poison could have affected me. I was a weak boy. Herbicides were good. I was a weak boy. I spent many, many years trying oh, to finally clean my body. And I think that's symbolic for what we're doing. It's, it's something that has not only happened to me. It's just a symbol of how we treat the world. Now I see the same thing happening around my community in, in Mexico, all over. The same kind of blindness. Okay. What would you like to happen? How can we go about joining our efforts to create another way to deal with forests and to relate communities, our own community building and the establishment of very prosperous, truly prosperous, lively, vital, thriving masses of trees that are more than the sum of the tree and evolve into something that gives more sense and value to it. First thing, I like using different words. Forestry, as it was taught in the world, is a copy of what was once successful in German reforestation. 250 years of forestry in Germany were the restoration of a country where 85% of, of the forest of the forest had been totally destroyed. And what they did, they said, well, this is a resource. It was destroyed because <coughs> the timber was used for the industry. And they 
there was an analogy. They said, this is a resource like we have them in mining. So they set up the first forestry school in the, university, in the mining university. <coughs> they treated the forest as if it were a mine. And they said, the only difference is it's renewable. You can plant trees. But still, you will mine them. That's exactly what's happening in the, in the Baltic states at the moment. You're mining your forest. So why does this happen? Because the same spirit of forestry education has been used throughout the world. German foresters were seen upon as the expert. And they built all the forestry schools in the world to follow the same pattern. And that pattern is a mining pattern. <coughs> so we have to create a new pattern. The word forest is the word forest is used for this imposition of in industry on the forest. It has nothing to do with the woods themselves. So the first thing is we should think about the forest in different terms. The Romans used two terms. They had the silver, which was the original woods, and the forest was the man-made, the planted, the structured. So when we start thinking, when we look at it as a system, the first thing is, well, let's not repeat being occupied with forests. Let's take the silver as the reference. Let's start designing our systems from understanding the forest the silver. Go into the natural mechanism. That is the first thing. Second, what is being taught in forestry schools is that the forest is the sum of timber structures on top of the ground. That is really not true. <clears throat> it is not true. I forgot to put on a t-shirt of mine that says 90% you don't see. The reality of our world is that we only live at the surface. We only see what is a surface phenomenon. It's a world that is like a world of mushrooms. Mushrooms are not only the most important plant in the forests, but they're also very symbolic for what happens there. We only see the mushrooms, what we call mushrooms. In reality, mushrooms are the communication system of the forest. And in reality, the most important biomass in the forest is composed by mushrooms and microorganisms. And it is under the ground. So when I restore a forest, and I find people who look at their forest and say, ah, we don't know what to do. There are big problems. We have insects eating the trees. We have whatsoever problems. They only look at the surface. We have to consider what 90% of this entity, of the original silva is. And this 90% is composed of the soil and water and all that is in it. And those are fungi, mushrooms, microorganisms. I managed to restore a mature rainforest on degraded land. Ecologists told me that'll take 600 years. I said, okay, I'll have to do something about my health <laughs> to live long enough. But I think it's more practical that I help the forest to do this job a little faster. So I concentrated on restoring the underground forest. I restored the mushrooms and the microorganisms. And when I had established an improved soil condition and a very strong underground something, then I started, then I did a tree nursery and then I planted the trees of the mature succession of the, train for, of the rainforest, the caoba trees, the mahogany. And foresters told me they will never grow, they will die. Because when you just plant them, they die. I have a 98% success rate. 
So we must look at the whole of the silver. We must look at the whole of the society. We must always consider the elders, all the adults and the children and, and even the way these are born, the way these care for each other, the way they relate to each other. The forest is at the same time not the stagnating thing, the stable thing that the foresters tell us about. The silver is very dynamic and very, very, very diverse. And if we do that, we can find all kinds of completely new opportunities. What else can we do? We have to think about different uses of the forest. Because if we are part of the forest, then the forest invites us to use it, to use elements of it. There's nothing bad about it. That is the essence of being part. I think trees, when you cut them the right way, when you get your timber from them the right way, they die very gracefully, as can chicken or pigs when they live in harmony with human society. I think we have to accept that life is composed of two main elements or two main, not elements, uh, events. events, events, it's birth and death. And we have to accept birth and death as being part of the system. We should never question it. We have people nowadays who, who basically question death. Then we shove our old people into el the homes for elderly and we shut the door so we don't see that. No, that is the most, one of the two most essential parts of our life. And that's the same in any living system. It is about how we are born and how we start our life and how we end it and how we die. That is the most important. And when we manage to do that gracefully and with conscience, which, with consciousness, then I think we will find so many more ways to use the capacities, the products, the subproducts, and, and so on that we have. To give you some ideas, here you have pine trees. We heard from Gunter Pauli about a community that he's been associated with for a long time in Colombia. They planted pine trees. Now, pine trees are not the most productive. The timber is not very valuable. Uh, they are often found in monocultures. But they are pioneer trees. So they looked at what they were doing and they said, the only tree that grows here is pine trees, so let's take that. And then, what is the function of the pine tree? And they said, well, at some age, the function of the pine tree is to shade the soil so other trees can grow in that shade. And so a real forest can develop. And they looked at the trees and said, well, in young age, they don't produce enough shade. And do you know what they started? They started coppicing the pine tree. They just cut off the tops of the young pine trees at a certain height. And then the pine trees started developing a low canopy. And they produced shade. And all of a sudden, diversity started rising below the shade. That's the role of humans. The forest itself doesn't mind if the process takes very long or goes very fast. But we have a need, we see a need to do things faster. So let's use our intelligence and get into the, I would say, mindset of the tree community and help it. We help. And then they asked, well, it doesn't make any sense here to harvest the timber. 
the market is too far away. It's not very valuable. If we transport it to the market, well, it'll be misery. And so they started tapping resin from the trees. And you know what they do? They produce, they separate the colophonium from the resin, and the rest is turpentine. They transport the turpentine to the city together with their agricultural goods, and they exchange it for the oil from the restaurants of their clients. So the truck goes full and it returns full. And they use the turpentine for gasoline. You can replace gasoline 100% by turpentine. Did you know you have, that you have tremendous gasoline fields around you in this country? That you can replace gas and gasoline by what could be tapped from the forest, from the existing silver. You can use 50% turpentine together with the oil from restaurants, this leftover oil, and use it as diesel. Only have to mix 50-50. Perfect opportunity. That is the kind of creative solutions we have to come up with. So then we ask, how could we get people into the forest so they would be tapping these trees? You need people to be there. So they need a new way to live, to, how to be housed. With some groups who are looking into possibilities to create tiny mobile houses that can be built from timber, hand-built, that are wonderful little houses, and that could be pulled to different places in the forest. The first initiative has just started. The first model for a tiny house is just being moved from where a little group of enthusiasts built it in northern Germany, and they are pulling it to Ukraine and the West Carpathia land and want to establish movable nomad communities with these little houses to be able to work the forest in a different way. We could work with mushrooms. You have in this country a long tradition of working, of collecting mushrooms, berries. We have them for breakfast in the morning, foxberries. There are many, many things that can be done and in the end will be more valuable than any of the timber that's being exported. But it needs people's involvement. I will leave it there, more or less. I would like to, for you to be able to ask questions, make proposals. We are collecting contacts to prepare for a bigger workshop on the topic. A silver workshop, maybe towards the end of the summer. Arrigudas <coughs> is very engaged in helping maybe organize the forest festival in Lithonia next year and there may be other things coming up. We have the impression that there's enough interest for a new approach to somehow develop. I can give you more written material when you need. <coughs> there are so many aspects to this. I hope I've given you some basic understanding of how we want to go about it. I once started writing what's needed as information, like 30 different topics at the moment, and there will probably be a hundred at some time, but which only means we can only solve it in the community. <coughs> okay. yes. You said you start with, uh, with the mushrooms and the microorganisms. How do you do it? The only thing you need to know is how to reproduce mushrooms and microorganisms and that we fortunately learned through the Effective Microorganism Initiative in, in Japan. Teruhiga left us a very good mythology, he only methodology. He just changed the way scientists look at mushrooms and microorganisms and through that all of a sudden a new way emerged of how you can reproduce them. So we use lactic acids as a basic. Anybody who is a good cheese, cheese producer somewhere can give you lactic acids. And once you have the lactic <coughs> acids, you can trap 
microorganisms and fungi in the forest and reproduce them in the lactic acid. Now it's a bit easier nowadays if you know someone who already works with this method, who already has effective microorganisms, take some of the mixture, reproduce it, as everybody does, we give them molasses or something to, to feed the microorganisms, and then go around the forest, look for the most mature forest areas that you can find and trap the microorganisms. Catch them. Now they don't run around. You have to put a little trap, you give them some food and uh, like a bit of boiled rice or oatmeal, oatmeal or anything. Uh, they, eat, they eat any carbohydrates and you can invent all kinds of little traps. Find your own way. You will see them mostly when they got into the trap. And then you start reproducing them and sometimes you will fail and very often they will work and you will in the end come to a mixture that represents the mature microorganism environments in the area and that you reproduce and reproduce and spray it. We just went around the forest spraying. Well, around the... You see, I'm using the word forest all the time when I really want to talk about silver. It's, you have to somehow come to a conclusion how we want to do the wording. It's probably very difficult to avoid the word forest. You need the consciousness that we are talking about forest in a different way. What do these microorganisms do? The mushrooms are the most developed, they are the most mature. They establish basically the communication system. Or one of, no, they establish not the, one of the more important communication systems in the forest. There are many others. There are others in the air, there are smells, there are all sorts of substances that flow around, float around in the forest and so on. Mm. But the nutrition of the mushrooms functions only in cooperation with bacteria and all kinds of other beings at that very small level of which we know very, very little. We hardly know about them. But they have different functions. And one of those functions is to catch energy. They are photosynthetic. Some are producers of certain nutrients. Some get these nutrients from the minerals, from the soil, from the rock. Some decompose matter. Some kill animals or beings that are not wanted for the system. Those are the coliforms that often they are destructive microorganisms that often cause us problems when they become too... But they play an important role because there are things... A dead being has to be destructed. So they are destructors, they are constructors, they are energy plants, they are long chains of nutrition and so on. We will never understand them all. Some 30, 40,000 of them have been identified and it is thought that maybe 10 times more exist. No scientific laboratory will get them all, but we can find them by functional groups and we can put them into mixtures and observe that the mixture is perceived as a support to the system as a whole. Then we can work with them. There can be many different mixtures. I hope that's understandable. Growing seed banks all over the world and also growing um, mushroom and material banks to exchange. Exchange is very good. I think we should not be afraid of doing this exchange. I, for quite a while, I took a mixture of uh, microorganisms from Austria, high altitude in Austria, into the rainforest because the mixture was very stable, and uh, and I observed how that behaved compared to my own. And that gave me a lot of learning opportunities. I think exchange is, at that level, very, very useful. These microorganisms are very intelligent. Anything that could be dangerous or harmful, they eliminate. They're probably more intelligent in that respect than we are. If I can comment, uh, the <coughs> studies about the relationships between the 
forests and, and the microorganisms. It's uh, very intensively done in Tartu University here, and they coordinate uh, the database about uh, life on, on the soils and how this uh, uh, interacts with uh, forests and, and this global uh, scientific uh, database. And it's open and it should be free. And, and it's everyone invited to collaborate there to, to, to give the information. And they have used this uh, also to help to regenerate uh, the forests in Africa and, and so on to explain that how, how, to, how to replant the forest mm -hmm. where, where it is extremely hard. In Estonian case, it's, uh, the story is a little bit complicated in. Uh, normal conditions so far till the, the, the end of last century or so on when the climate started to change very rapidly. Uh, the end condition of the forest for the through the succession is uh, dark uh, spruce forests which is uh, quite uh, uh, quite low in biodiversity because the soils are becoming very acid and, and uh, it's dark and, and so on. And through my studies, I have witnessed, uh, I have seen that uh, it seems that uh, some 5,000 years ago, that probably most of our forests burned down because it was a spruce dominated forest. And I have, can see from my data that there is a lot of forest fires that have happened. And so it's one of the explanations that we can use the forest, the timber, as if we are copying the, the nature, that uh, through the forest fire, it uh, regenerates. But what we have done now is that we have extended the borders. So how much we, uh, we, we clear cut instead of taking just the needed trees uh, yeah. from out of uh, uh, from the forest. And, and this is uh, the one of the part of the big debate what uh, timber companies are saying that they explain that oh, this is a copying of nature. But uh, the, the the truth is that we need the dead woods in the, in the forest because a lot of uh, living species they, they need just these dead trees and a lot of species are related with the burnt uh, trees. We have the same thing in Tennessee where you have this fire succession and you have this, uh, the climax forest is the spruce or the pine that's full of aromatic oils and then suddenly there's a conflagration and those oils just explode. You have this incredible intensity of fire. It scorches the ground and there are seeds of the previous hardwood forest, the oaks, the red oaks. They only come back in after a fire. The charcoal is necessary for them. The, the temperature of the sun on the earth in the bare soil is necessary for them. They only come at that point. So there's this long-term successional process. It's disturbance is a very important part of it in the middle of the process. But I, I wanted to, uh, your, your talk reminded me a story what told me my son uh, last year when he was five years old, <laughs> that uh, why the leaves are coming onto the trees during the spring, because the trees want to dance, and when the birds are coming back from south, uh, and starting to sing, the uh, trees want to dance and they, 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 they produce <laughs> leaves and, and, and also when the birds are going back to south, the trees are so sad that they fall And it was five year old, the good son so very wow. story. Then it is real. <laughs> yeah, back to Albert's and, and your argument. It, when we look at the forest as a living, a vital community, then we will not go for the climax forest. This is like wanting to establish a community of old people. Mm -hmm. yeah? Once, you see how the analogy can really help us. Yeah. That's exactly what we do not want to happen. That's the asylum. I could imagine that if we put more old people into these asylums, at the end, in some asylums, they will, they will set fire to their old asylum. That's what the climate forest does. <laughs> because it's so terrible. No, what we need is diversity of all the different stages. I'll give you one example. The peninsula of Yucatan, it's a big area. It used to be the world's 
biggest producer of honey. There was one year, in, I think it was 1972, when the peninsula of Yucatan produced 42,000 tons of honey. Wonderful honey, some of the best honey in the world. <coughs> Nowadays, it produces between five and 7,000 tons. From 42,000 down to five to seven. Why? Because the bees needed the diversity of ecosystems. The most important factor for the productivity of the bees, which reflect all sorts of other productivities, is the diversity of the ecosystem. Many different patches of different successions or ecosystems or biotopes or whatever you want to call them. And that was only possible through the engagement of Mayan farmers who were knowledgeable, knowledgeable of their ecosystem and who lived in the fault, really lived in it. A Mayan boy at that time, at those times when he was 15, he basically knew every single one of the 60 or some tree species in the area. He knew most of the plants and he knew how to create successions, how to transform a patch of forest of a certain development into another state. That was the essential part of the education in the family. And the girls at the age of 12 knew how to run a household. And learning to, or knowing how to run a household included how to use all the products that came from the forest and transform them into food and maintain the relationship, the social relationships in a family where the men would go from time to time and disappear for some weeks, sometimes even for months, in the forest. That's exactly what we would need. The biggest culprit in changing all that, you know who, what that is? Public education. Public education destroyed all the traditional education. And it's useless to anything you would do in the village. Those who live in communities have a lot of experience with that. I guess. And that was all not so long ago. I went to live in a Mayan community when it was still completely indigenous and the full knowledge was still there. The full knowledge of the supposedly collapsed Mayan civilization had never collapsed. The knowledge was existing. They practiced it. In 79, 40 years ago. So we should be able to recuperate these things. It's all quite recent. We still have a chance. This last round in the blue tent talked about hope. Yeah, hope is that the, the background for that kind of diversity can still be found somewhere. We can still activate it. We need all generations to activate them. But we need the right concept. Let's not continue focusing on climax, optimum, the biggest, the greatest. The, that's the imperial ideology that's being implanted all over the world. That's imperialism. No. The real essence is community of all those who contribute. And there's nobody in a community who does not contribute. The oldest do, and the very smallest and youngest do. In this nice book that Peter Wohlleben wrote about the, what's the name? Life of Truth. <coughs> Secret life, <coughs> hidden life of trees. <coughs> He cites his initial experience. He discovered a tree stump that was covered by vegetation. And he was very surprised, being a forester, a very knowledgeable, experienced forester, he was very surprised to realize this was a very old tree stump. And he tried to reconstruct the history of that forest. And he said, this tree stump must have been a stump maybe for 200 years. And he took his pocket knife and he scraped at the wood, and the wood was alive. 
And the only conclusion was the other trees that are connected to this stump keep it alive. They feed this old stump because it has an important role to play in society. It's the beautiful beginning of his book. Thank you.